Hello and welcome to the group room where we're at the 34th annual CTRC AACR San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Where I have the pleasure of sitting with Dr. Eric Weiner. Dr. Weiner is Chief of Women's Cancers at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Hello. Hello, Good Dr. Afternoon. Weiner. So, Dr. Weiner, we're going to talk about a couple of things with you. The plenary lecture of endocrine therapy for breast cancer. Thank you for spending time sure. talking to us about these two areas that you were involved with. I had the privilege and pleasure of, uh, of giving one of the plenary talks here, which um, was on endocrine therapy for breast cancer, looking into the future. And I really focused on a few different areas, but perhaps most importantly started with with uh, the unfortunate realization, or I un underscored the realization, that we actually haven't made very much progress in endocrine therapy over the past two decades. We've made some, but it's been l less than many would, would, would like. Um, for many, many years, tamoxifen was the standard treatment um, for all women with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Now, over the course of the past five to 10 years, the aromatase inhibitors in postmenopausal women have come into the picture, and whether aromatase inhibitors are given in place of tamoxifen or after tamoxifen, they do reduce recurrences to a small extent, meaning three to four percent better. But what they haven't done is change overall survival. And ultimately, I think our goal is to help women with breast cancer live better lives and, in truth, longer lives. Um, in premenopausal women, tamoxifen is still the standard. We don't know, and hopefully we will know within the next few years, whether suppressing a woman's ovaries is of added benefit. And in the metastatic setting, although there were some very encouraging reports at this meeting, at least until this meeting, there have not been studies that have demonstrated prolongation and survival with hormonal therapy or with new hormonal therapies. And so I, I focused on why that's the case. Why haven't we done better? And in my mind, it's, it's, it's really a result of three different issues. One um, is the fact that estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is a very, very varied and heterogeneous disease. Seventy-five percent of all breast cancer is estrogen receptor positive, and this is not a single entity. It is many, many different entities and is in and of itself um, probably at least half a dozen different major diseases. We, at a minimum, think about what is often called luminal A breast cancer as being different from luminal B breast cancer. These are two genetic classifications, but luminal A breast cancer tends to be relatively slow-growing estrogen receptor positive breast cancer that tends to be very responsive to hormonal therapy. Luminal B breast cancer tends to be estrogen receptor positive breast cancer that is somewhat faster growing and is less responsive to hormonal therapy. And then we have another group, which is the group of tumors that are HER2 positive and estrogen receptor positive. And one of the problems in many of the studies that we've done is that we lump or have lumped all of these patients together and try to answer questions in the entire group, when in fact we probably should be separating out those groups and potentially asking different questions in different groups of patients. And I think as we move forward, our ability to move the field more rapidly in a positive direction is going to depend on um, our ability to subdivide this disease so that we're no longer taking a one-size-fits-all approach, but we're taking a much more personalized approach. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that for the roughly 130 or 40,000 cases of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer in the United States each year that we need 140,000 different treatment plans. And I don't think that that's feasible and I don't think that that's necessary. But I do know that we need to more than one. And I think that that's what we're going to be seeing more and more of. The second problem 
that we face with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is that many recurrences of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer arise long after the diagnosis. Well over half of all of the recurrences that will arise in a woman with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer occur after the five-year point, at year six, year seven, year nine, year 12, what have you. And we have done relatively little in the way of research to prevent those late recurrences. There have been some studies with aromatase inhibitors, but as we've moved the aromatase inhibitors earlier in the, in the course of treatment, we're focusing less on what to do after five years. And in my mind, one of the absolutely critical uh, pieces of work that has to be done is sorting out how to, what causes and then how to prevent late recurrences of breast cancer. And again, I emphasize that this can happen over the course of many years, but there are women, and, and we all know this, who have breast cancer, for example, in 1990, and have a recurrence of breast cancer in 2010, literally 20 years later. They generally live for a long time when they have that recurrence, even if that recurrence is to a distant site, meaning the lungs, the liver, the bones, but ultimately, they still die of breast cancer with our presently available therapy, and we need to take steps to prevent those late recurrences. And finally, there's the problem of drug resistance. Uh, we have good drugs, but we don't have perfect drugs. Cancer cells are smart. They figure out ways around the drugs we throw at them, and we need to gain a better understanding of what promotes resistance to drugs, and how to get around that. Is there any value to chemosensitivity testing? There is, well, for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, the whole role of chemotherapy is far more limited than in estrogen receptor negative or HER2 positive breast cancer. Um, but across the board, there probably isn't much of a role for chemotherapy sensitivity testing. Um, there are some who might argue that some of those tests um, will help to identify drugs that may not work. None of them are very good at identifying drugs that will work. That said, there are an increasing number of molecular markers that need to be tested to see if they can predict for greater sensitivity, particularly to hormonal therapy agents or hormonal therapies. Um, so I, in my mind, we have a lot of work to do in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. It's interesting, you know, we have viewed this as less of a priority, I think, for a number of years. We've focused on HER2 positive breast cancer. It's been a big focus on triple negative breast cancer. But 75% of breast cancer is estrogen receptor positive. The majority of deaths from breast cancer arise in this group of women. And while most of these women will live with breast cancer for an extended period of time, that's not good enough. And we want to get to a point where we can reliably say that a woman diagnosed with breast cancer isn't going to experience a recurrence and isn't going to die of her disease. So if tamoxifen and the classification of aromatase inhibitors have been and still remain the standard of care for endocrine therapy, Where's research going now? What's in the pipeline? There are a number of avenues that are being pursued. Um, there are some new hormonal agents that are being looked at, and some may be better than the drugs we have. But much of the thrust is on combining hormonal agents with other biologic agents. So agents like mTOR inhibitors that we heard reported at this meeting, the drug um, Everolimus, always a hard name to pronounce, um, but Everolimus, which is also called RAD001, which is also called Affinitor, so you can pick the name that you're most comfortable pronouncing. Um, the combination of that drug with exemestane looked like it was much more effective than exemestane alone in women who already had resistance to an aromatase inhibitor. 
And so I think that we're going to be hearing about more and more drugs um, that can be combined with hormonal therapy to essentially get around the, the obstacles that the cancer cell is putting in the path, um, preventing hormonal therapy from being as effective as it can be. Thank you. I, we will anxiously await for, for news there because up until now this really is all women yep. know about and they are blank. It's, it's like it's, it's one or the other based on your age. There's, there's one other quick point that I want to make which is that we also haven't identified the women who don't need hormonal therapy but have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer partially because we've perceived hormonal therapy as being relatively non-toxic. It's easier than chemotherapy. But if you're a woman with breast cancer, it's a lot better not to be on a medicine for five years or more than five years than to be on a medicine. And the side effects with hormonal therapy can be pretty hard. So hot flashes and vaginal dryness. Such a major quality of life yep. problem. All of these things and, and you know, little annoying side effects that you can put up with for a week or two become a lot more than annoying when you're putting up with them for a year or two or three or four or five. And then you have compliance issues on top of it because of it. And when you mention Lumina A and, and, and B, yeah. when you test for that, if it turns out that your status makes you maybe less, showing less benefit to an a, to a endocrine therapy, maybe those women will be weaned out of well, that, that I think is, is one of the hopes, is that we will be able to identify people either because they have such a good prognosis without anything that they don't need treatment, or because their prognosis may not be as good, but hormonal therapy isn't going to help. Right, and let them have quality of life. And there's no sense in giving people a medicine that isn't going to help just because they have a poor prognosis. What we need to do there is work on the medicines that are going to help improve their prognosis. It should be clear for people listening that luminal A and luminal B is a, are, represent genetic classifications. We don't yet test for that in the I clinic, see. but we test for other features of the cancer that correlate with mm -hmm. luminal A and luminal B. Thank you, Dr. Eric Weiner, Chief of Women's Cancers, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Thanks for having me. Thanks again.